Good evening, I'm Abby Harris of Borman High School TV, along with my co-host, attorney Mark Huberman, and we are very excited to bring you another installment of Borman Biography, a BSDM program devoted to profiling educators and community leaders who have made significant contribu contributions to the Borman schools and or the Borman community. In selecting today's guest, we have an incredibly talented Boardman graduate who, in my view, personifies everything that is best about the arts in Boardman. Speaking of none other than the pride of the class of 1975, all right, Rick Blackson. Rick, welcome <laughs> Thank to Boardman Biography. Mark. Thank you. I don't know if Fred Davis might have a, an issue with that. You know, he was, well, he wasn't exactly <laughs> in the arts. He was more in the athletics. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Um, before getting into your professional career, tell us about your background. Did you grow up in Boardman? Now, I grew up in western Pennsylvania, a little town called Mercer, about uh, 45 miles from here. And um, my dad was an auctioneer. My mom uh, helped him out in his furniture business and his bowling alley and his auction business. And my dad was a bit of a ham, so I think that uh, that's probably where I noticed uh, that I got a little bit of that performance bug probably from my dad. He always enjoyed be having the microphone and was very comfortable in front of his auction crowds. Got them laughing and drew them in and everything. And, always had a real likable personality and that so I think that that probably was an influence for me just kind of growing up around that. Um, do your parents still live in Boardman on Stadium Drive? They do. Uh, after, um, after they had moved to Boardman uh, the, uh, in the 1970s, they've uh, been here ever since and uh, I'm really very blessed that they're both healthy and well and on Stadium Drive. Probably going to be watching this at some point. Hi mom and dad. <laughs> Um, do you have any brothers and sisters? I do. Two older sisters. They're both married, live in Pennsylvania, and I have my younger brother Gary who lives in New Springfield, Ohio, all the way over in the country there with his wife and uh, his son Jeremy, his daughters Marissa and, uh, and Jocelyn, are grown up now. <laughs> um, I understand you moved to Borman in the eighth grade. Did you attend Glenwood or Center? I was at Center Middle School for one year. and. Uh, saw that big auditorium. In fact, or, eighth grade orientation was in the old uh, Boardman Center Middle School auditorium. I remember how wide and expansive it seemed to me at the time and, and uh, I never knew that years later I'd be on that stage quite a bit. So your dad was an auctioneer, so he was behind the mic. And any music in your family? That's the thing. Not really. Like my mother's side of the family, I'd heard that there were people that were very gifted musicians and um, some of her uncles and whatnot played some instruments. But in the immediate family, no. Uh, we, we didn't even listen to the radio that much growing up. Just a handful of records, and that's about it. Uh, but when I was a little boy, about age four, my dad's furniture store had a little chord organ for sale. And I used to go like any little kid would and play around with it. Well, the lady that worked for my dad happened to know how to play keyboards. She saw that I was interested. I knew my numbers. I knew my letters. She showed me how to do it. I seemed to have aptitude for it. By the age of six, one of my dad's furniture customers happened to own a little piano store, so they bartered a spin at Worldster piano for uh, some furniture, and uh, I started taking lessons when I was six years old. And the rest, they say? Is an unusual history because by the time I was 12, I didn't want to do lessons anymore. I quit piano. I didn't want anything to do with it. But I kept playing, and some of the kids at my church at that time started saying, hey, Rick, you can play this. And there was a girls' trio at my church that needed a piano player. I was 13 or 14 years old. If I could be their accompanist, I could hang out with those girls. So that was pretty good motivation. That's a good motivation. And I, and I got back into it again and just started to, to play a lot more and began developing my own style. So are you and, one of these guys, can you play by ear? Um, mine is more of a combination of, of some playing by ear, but it's mostly I'm, I'm more of a sight person but I can extrapolate from what I'm seeing and play by ear. A lot of us have music teacher. You're a music teacher to a lot of people around here. We'll talk about that later. Who was your music teacher? Uh, a guy named Claire Williman. He was the gentleman that bought furniture from my dad, sold him the piano, and he was in Hermitage, Pennsylvania in the Sharon, you know, that whole hickory was called back in those days. And he was quite a well-known uh, piano and organ salesman and also a very, very good uh, keyboard player in his own right and did a lot of entertaining in that area. How many years did you take from him? About five or about maybe three to four with him and then a couple of his assist, assistants uh, later. And then when I came over here to Boardman, I remember a lady named Vivian Keener just briefly. Um, that, um, that was about the end of my, my keyboard training. So when, when you hit center middle school, did you, were you involved in the chorus or the band? And who was your teacher back when? 
or did you not get involved? Not, in, not in yet, school? not at Center Middle School. I didn't do the music thing there then, uh, but uh, that wasn't until I came over here okay, to the well, high school. Okay, big time is you hit Boardman High School. And you were in this Boardman High School, right? Absolutely, yeah. This was a very new school then, and it was state-of-the-art, and I just thought that it was the best place. I thought Boardman was the best place, the center of the world. We had this amazing Southern Park Mall that nothing could be bigger and finer than that. We had this amazing brand-new high school, nothing could be bigger and better than that. had elevators and everything, and I needed them because I was in a cast when I came in here as a freshman. For what? I got ran over by a wheelchair, Mark. <laughs> I was at the Canfield Fairgrounds. A guy ran into me. The pedal sliced my Achilles tendon. I had to have two hours surgery. was in a cast. So here I am bounding down the hallways of Boardman High School and you know, on crutches my first year. But what happened was um, the, uh, I wasn't involved in the music program directly, but after a period of time, uh, my mom was real instrumental, and thankfully she was. She went over and visited with Mrs. Humphrey. And that, this is the part I think will be interesting to a lot of the older for people everybody. watching. The choir teacher here at the high school, the choral teacher for... A legend. A legend. Ethelita Humphrey, whenever I came here in 1970, 71, around that time, was, had been here for, for, for decades then. And um, she was uh, quite a mentor to me. I really learned a lot from her. But what ended up happening was my mom talked to her and said, my son plays the piano, do you have any... Thing, any openings and so what it ended up happening was she said yeah have him come over and audition I went over and played for her and could sight read a little bit and uh, she invited me to be the teen chorus director and uh, so uh, that was my first experience. So did you become one of the accompanists? I became one of the accompanists and that's where I met a young a very young teacher had long stylishly cut hair for the 1970s he was so youthful that many of the parents thought he was one of the students and his name was Errol Kerberg and that was I believe his first year here at Boardman High School and, uh, and he ended up becoming one of my uh, very influential mentors as well. And he succeeded Ethelita Humphrey. And he of course succeeded Ethelita Humphrey and took the reins of all the, uh, the programs here. But that experience with her was phenomenal because you have to understand Mrs. Humphrey had had a lot of experience with some of the great choral music groups that were around this country back in the 40s and 50s, like Fred Waring and the Pennsylvanians. She had had a lot of experience. And so when I began working with her, she really coached me and spent a lot of one-on-one -on -one time teaching me the finer points of following a conductor and responding to singers. And I can still see her directing. Oh, yeah, that. I can too. <laughs> it's and, in your genes. <laughs> and she, uh, she really uh, worked with me, and uh, I'm very, very... Uh, thankful that she did because it uh, helped me to become and develop a little bit of an appetite for finer music as well because I, like I said, culturally I had had very little exposure to music. Bill Dykins, tell us about your experience and how you became involved with Bill Dykins. Well, first of all, I think that almost anyone who had an experience with, uh, with the legendary Mr. Dykins would have to say whether they had him as a teacher or if he, they had him as a, uh, a, a director he, le he leaves an indelible impression. And um, my first working with him was that they, he or somebody from the theater department asked Mrs. Humphrey if there was anybody that could become a rehearsal accompanist for Kismet. And that would have been my junior year in the year of 1973-74. And uh, so I did become the rehearsal accompaniment, accompanist for Kismet. At that time, I knew so little about Broadway musicals, I didn't even know what they were. I thought I'd heard of Hello Dolly. I thought it was a song. I didn't know it was a show. I didn't know what a show was. So here I go to uh, these rehearsals for Kismet, and here's this guy, this ball of energy with this amazing ability to communicate to kids and to get them to do things that they would never ordinarily do. And he talked about acting from the gut. He talked about comic timing and how if you wait just that split second to say a line, it could be the difference between a chuckle and a laugh. And projecting. And projecting, oh, absolutely. You, we were in that big, the old cow palace there, you know, Boardman Center Middle School Auditorium. Place was really wide and spread out. And he would just, like we were talking earlier, if he couldn't hear you, he'd be back in his place back there at the back of the, and he'd start to babble these words out and just kind of mock you and imitate you, you know. You know, and that was your signal that, hey, we're not getting in the back here. And he taught us to not kill the influence, you know. So a lot of Did you get any show yourself? I was so fascinated watching Kismet that I remember him working with Carl Campbell. 
whose dad was the uh, long time custodian here, wonderful man. Carl Campbell had the character role, the funny guy, and I thought, I could do that. I really think I could do that. So I auditioned for Hello Dolly, of all things, uh, that spring, and did land the role of Horace Vandergelder for my senior year, which would have been the year of 74 and 75. And of course, the, uh, the, the, the wonderful Jessica Houston was a, a standout performer. She had lead roles as a sophomore in Kismet, as Dolly in uh, Hello Dolly, and then her third year, her senior year, she was, uh, after I was, had graduated, she was uh, MAME. In MAME, she was a wonderful performer. Terrific experience. Doing that, I think, was the, I learned more about performing from Bill Dykins than I did anyone and was the most influenced by him. Didn't we all? Yeah. Um, did you attend YSU right after high school? Yes, I did. I was only 17. Didn't really know what I was doing. I went down. I tried to be a music major, but I'd had no formal, you know, music training and that type of music. So it just didn't really work out for me. I ended up trying some different majors. But I did take accrue a lot of music credits down there and ended up transferring. But it was around that time that Mr. Dykins called me back to Boardman High School to music direct a couple of shows here. And I did the Fantastics with um, one of my best friends to this day, Todd Harmon, um, and a, a young man by the name of Tim Welsh, whose son, I believe, has been very active around here. One of the here. best performers, his, Tim Jr. Not that Timmy wasn't bad, but his son, one of the best ever been on this stage. Well, Todd and Tim played the fathers uh, in the Fantastics, if anyone's familiar with that show. And uh, You're a Good Man, Charlie Brown might have preceded the Fantastics. And Charlie Brown was played by Mahoning Valley Clerk of Courts, Mahoning County Clerk of Courts, Tony Vivo, also known as Champ Summers. There you go. One of my best friends, too, back in the day there. So something called the Rich Morrow Review? Rich Morrow was a Boardman graduate, a very fine drummer, and another baseball player. We all played baseball together. And Rich and I started a band, and we played in lounges all around the area, and some out of town. And eventually, we found out that Don Abraham might be interested. Now, Don had been part of a very popular gospel group, the Abraham Brothers, in the early 70s. Boardman High School graduate, wonderful singer and performer, became the lead singer in the Rich Morrow Band. And um, was a, Don happened to be a terrific Elvis impersonator, too, by the way. I don't know if you want to know about that story, but we, there was a, an assembly that the Rich Morrow Band did here called A Tribute to Elvis, and Don Abraham played Elvis, like I said, he did it wonderfully, and Don was quite the ladies' man. And I will never forget, that assembly was absolutely packed, and a lot of the teachers came in because they were all Elvis fans back in those days. And the kids, a lot of them didn't really know much. Elvis had passed away and there had been a big furor about that. but. Um, we did this Elvis show, and we had a uh, big orchestration kind of a thing that we had put together with keyboard, early keyboard synthesizers, and I had my friend Todd Harmon, Pam Porter, Gretzinger now, Kathy Freeberg had been a uh, Boardman uh, High School uh, chorale member, and we had the backup singers, the whole deal, and we did this show, and the girls, because Don was quite the ladies' man, they, they went crazy. So it felt like a real Elvis concert, because every move that Don did, those girls were just eating. Where is he today? And they were screaming. They were going Where's crazy. Where's Don today? Don is, has been a very successful cruise ship entertainer. He's been a headliner on cruise ships. And over the course of his life, he's, he's really embraced his gospel music roots and heritage again. And he's been promoting some gospel concerts, some pretty high profile, profile things around the area here for the last I couple of years. I saw in your, uh, in your uh, in some background information that you went to some place called Anderson University. What's Anderson that? University. Where is that? Anderson is in Anderson, Indiana, 35 miles northeast of Indianapolis, and it was a, a Christian liberal arts school. Very, very good academics, about two to 3,000 students. It would probably be something like uh, Westminster College. And uh, they had really fine music and, uh, and other, you know, the full liberal arts curriculum. And I had a great education there, was involved in a lot of their music. Did you get musical. your degree from there? Yeah, I got a religion degree from there, because for a while I kind of thought about the possibility of doing uh, of getting into ministry work full time. That never panned out because all the music and performance things kept overtaking me. And the school had excellent opportunities to perform and to be involved in those kind of things. So I ended up uh, traveling and touring with groups there from the university. Even after I graduated from there, I did that. And I, I was a music director for several of their touring groups and traveled the country extensively for four years with wow. a couple of music groups, produced a couple albums. And, and your 
68 years old now mm -hmm. for all this yeah. travel? <laughs> yeah, something like that, huh? Mm -hmm. um, you are perhaps best known for your long association with Mary Jo Meluso. How did that come about? Yeah, Mary Jo is my best friend and my, my wonderful wife. And uh, we met in 1990. At that time, I was working with Easy Street Productions as their music director. We can talk about that if we have time later. But um, Mary Jo was someone I had known because everybody around here knew Mary Jo. She had been, uh, she had hosted Young's, Good Morning Youngstown. She had been um, the host of a show called Pal, 33 Pal, which a lot of kids watched back in the day, a game show. And she was an equity actress who had played Guinevere at Carousel Dinner Theater, had studied in New York with a legendary She did Maria and West Side Story at the she Playhouse. She did Maria and West Side Story at the Playhouse so. and numerous other roles at the Playhouse. So, but I'd never met her. And her mom, had come, who was the Federal Plaza director at the time, came across an old song that needed to be recorded, asked Mary Jo to do it. At that time, she begrudgingly accepted. Took it, they took it to me because they knew that this Easy Street had a music director. And they, at, the, at that time, we were at the Uptown Theater. And we worked on that song together. That's how Mary Jo and I met. But at that time, neither one of us were in a position in our lives to take it any further than that. So later on when I met her, we both were able to, to um, to get together and to meet one another and to talk and to visit and then we, the, it just took one time for me. So how many years spitting. have you been a cabaret act? We've been, we started doing that almost to me, almost from the onset. We started to perform together and that's when she brought in her old mentor, Bob, Bob Vargo, who in my adult life has been my most influential mentor. Bob Vargo had the theater arts program at Wilson High School forever and is Speech now- Speech teacher retired. and director. Right, exactly. And, and um, the playhouse. And the play, and, and, and everything else. And everything else. else. Yeah, and of course, in his own right, he's uh, a, a consultant to the theatrical business. And, and a, a gifted a, actor. Gifted, oh my goodness, yeah. And the guy has an amazing pedigree. Yeah. And uh, Bob helped us out. He took us under his wing and he told us what cabaret was, taught us all, all the So ropes. how often do you guys perform? Um, we perform, um, in the good years when everything is really going well, when we're, aggressively, when, when we're aggressively seeking it, we will perform anywhere between maybe a couple dozen to maybe 50 some performances a year. So it's not grueling, but it's very active. And then in uh, years when we're not pursuing it as much, which has been the last several years, then we tone and pare it down quite a bit. Do you do that. weddings? Do you do? Occasionally we'll, we'll do like after, you know, we'll do like a wedding reception or something. And every once in a while people even hire us to do the songs for the ceremony. But the biggest thing, I suppose the bread and butter is you teach, right? Right, exactly. What do you teach? I have uh, piano and vocal students, and um, I'm very, very, very blessed again because uh, it's it's grown to over 60 students a week, so it's a very, wow. very busy schedule. And um, I've had some Boardman students, of course, Poland, Canfield, New Springfield, Columbiana, Salem, and I go to people's homes, and that's the niche that I found really. And the last works. thing is, uh, you're very involved in your church. Yeah, well, not as much now. Um, for, uh, I, for about 30 out of the 33 years that I was around here, I was the music uh, leader for um, Simon Road Church of God. Right around the corner. Yeah, right. exactly. And um, then in recent years, um, then I needed that time to do some other things, so I haven't been as active there. But, uh, yeah, that was something, a big part of my life, and that was another way I cultivated a lot of the piano skills doing that. Well, Mr. Blackson, we're about the, at the end of this edition of Borman Biography, but I want to take this opportunity to thank you for being with us and for your great service to the community. It's been my pleasure. Thank you, and uh, thank you for letting me talk your ears off today. I hope it was somewhat interesting for whomever might be watching okay. today. Rick, uh, you are, uh, as I said at the outset, you're a great Boardman success story. Thank you. Um, if anybody personified what the arts produce in Boardman, I think you, your old buddy Todd, and a few others are, are it. Um, it was a pleasure to finally have you back at Boardman High School and uh, <laughs> back in our studio here. And, uh, and um, I say we go back a long way. Glad to be with you. My and daughter one, one Lisa my, was one of your yeah, students. You talk about talking your ear off. Well, my the, daughter can talk your Lisa, ear off. Lisa, as a 12 year old, was the most literate, most uh, amazingly gifted, uh, culturally informed child I've ever met. She Thanks. was amazing. Well, you were a real inspiration <laughs> to her just like you're an inspiration to a lot of folks. Rick, thank thanks you for being with us. Abby, thanks. Thanks. Hey, it's great to be with you. <laughs> you too. We hope you have once again enjoyed this edition of Borman Biography. If you have suggestions to other individuals you would like to see profiled on this program, please pass them along and we will do our best to get it scheduled. Until then, we hope you will continue to support the Borman School's television network.